Please be seated. Distinguished guests, members of the faculty and staff, family and friends of the graduates, and members of the graduating class, welcome to the Executive MBA Commencement Ceremony for the Haas School of Business. I'm Ann Harrison, Dean of the Haas School of Business, and it's my great honor to officiate and celebrate in person this momentous occasion with you. But first, I would like to take this moment to recognize the spouses, significant others, the children, the extended family members, and friends who supported our graduates during what I imagine were some of the most challenging two years of their lives. This is your graduation too. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> we gather here today to recognize and rejoice in the achievements of the class of 2020. Nearly two years ago, you joined a world-class institution at the epicenter of innovation. You were already accomplished professionals before coming to Haas, but you decided to invest in yourselves to become indispensable business leaders. You did all of this while balancing your careers, family responsibilities, and personal lives. You spent two and a half terms on campus, stretching yourself academically and personally. You took your lessons learned in the classroom back to work, you tested them out in real time, and you shared your insights with faculty and classmates. You connected with people whose backgrounds differed from yours, and you formed deep bonds through events and activities like the class campfire, football games, bowling, s'mores, karaoke, and secret Santa parties. But suddenly, your world was upended. The global pandemic disrupted your MBA experience in the middle of term three, and classes shifted from in-person to remote instruction. In addition to grappling with this abrupt change at Haas, you had to navigate other unexpected challenges. Among them were homeschooling your children, caring for loved ones, and making really tough business decisions. I know that this was not the experience that you had expected. It's not what we wanted for you either. In spite of these extraordinary challenges, you all soldiered on. You all embodied the defining leadership principles, the ethos that anchors and binds us. And I could not be more proud. You answered a call from a classmate in need of medical supplies by establishing One Link, an online marketplace that allows donors and recipients to request and receive supplies in high demand. You spoke out against racial injustices and created an anti-racism resource list for all to use. You served as the glue of your cohort, hosting virtual activities to keep up morale during COVID. You joined startups aimed at helping military veterans advance in their careers. Some of you moved up the corporate ladder or pivoted to a new company or industry. And many of you exercised lessons learned in class and applied them to your own family businesses, laying the foundation for future generations. I am in awe of your, resist, of your resilience, your altruism, and your leadership. It was not by accident that you came to Haas and mastered a rigorous curriculum during a pandemic. You were chosen. 
And unlike any other class, you have developed a new kind of business acumen and leadership style that's now required to thrive in our new normal. Simply put, you are the heart of what's next. I look forward to seeing what you will accomplish in the future. Take a moment, look around the room, look next to you. These will be your friends for life. You also inherited a global network that includes over 40,000 Haas alum and more than 500,000 UC Berkeley alumni. I encourage you to lean on your Haas community, no matter how big or small the issue. Come to reunion, your first opportunity will be April 29th, 2022. And don't forget, you still have a chance to go to Copenhagen in May of 2022. Answer calls from prospective and current students who need your advice. And lastly, hire Haas. Your Haas education will benefit you for a lifetime, which is why your class gift committee set a goal of leaving a lifetime legacy with Haas. I'd like to thank at this point, Sarah Morrell and Munaj Patel, your co-VPs of philanthropy and the entire class gift committee for their visionary leadership in the EMBA 2020 class campaign. They set an ambitious goal during a very difficult time to endow the Beyond Yourself Fellowship originally founded by the EMBA 16s and to support the entrepreneurship initiative at Haas and the Haas Fund. Thanks to you and members of the EMBA class of 2016, I am proud to announce your class gift committee has met its fundraising goal of $250,000. This is a record for the EMBA class gift. <laughs> now more than ever, the world needs Haas graduates who recognize the importance of values-based leadership and a principled approach to managing people, organizations, and resources. Go out and leave your mark on the world. I now would like to introduce our student speaker, Hannah Greenberg. Hannah won the Beyond Yourself Award and is one of three recipients of the Berkeley Leader Award given to students who embody all four principles. She served as a graduate student instructor and was instrumental in keeping the cohort connected during the pandemic. Hannah recently co-founded a new search fund called Venn Capital Partners with classmate Alex Lopez, EMBA 20. P please join me in welcoming Hannah Greenberg. Thank you, Dean Harrison, for your kind introduction. Class of 2020, plus one. You've placed your trust and memories of this day in my hands. I consider this the greatest gift, and I hope I do it justice. Truthfully, writing this speech turned out to be the hardest assignment of the EMBA curriculum, including the 16 cases and writs from turnarounds. But before I start, I wanna make sure everyone, especially Nargis, knows this is being recorded and will be available on B courses tonight. We didn't see it coming, did we? We were in the throes of our operations group final project, Q Little's Law, and our macroeconomics country presentations 
when 2020 slammed into us with a big F U of a road rageous middle finger. The pandemic shut down the Berkeley campus in March. In May, Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd, which seemed to be playing on a continuous loop on every screen everywhere, sparking a summer of protests of underlying systemic racism in this country. For too many of us, it was more than just a screen loop. For too many of us, it was a tragic reminder of a society struggling to be just, an all too common an occurrence before cell phones flashed it across the screens for all of us to see. For too many of us, the pandemic, COVID, was a hole in our hearts that was ripped open as we had to say goodbye to loved ones over these last 18 months. We couldn't avoid watching these traumas even if we tried. And then in September, the crystal blue skies dimmed to the hellish orange of wildfire smoke that landscaped the Bay Area. And after all of that, because it's clearly not enough, a fiercely destabilizing election season culminated in a violent right-wing mob determined to block the transfer of power from one president to the next, storming the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. With the convergence of all of these events, it is often felt like the fundamental structures of nature and society were quaking before us, as if an apocalypse was upon us. And we could all look at it that way. Or we could look at it for what it was, a chance that we haven't had before, the pains that led to the birth of something we haven't seen before, an introduction to a new world where you and I get to lead the charge. Watching this past election season gave us insight as to how the decisions we will soon make in the boardroom will influence what happens in Washington, D.C. and our local governments. Watching blaze upon blaze is a call to action for us as new leaders to help brainstorm and implement strategies to douse the flames of climate change before the damage reaches the point of no return. And the murder of George Floyd and uptick in violence against Asian Americans are flashing neon reminders that we have not yet reached equality. And because we are all sitting at increasingly more important tables of influence, I ask you all, in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as he shared his dream with like-minded protesters at the March on Washington, to continue to move forward the needle of equality to leverage our positions in such a way that moves the government to finally make good on its promises to all Americans, and to cash the check it wrote to every American in the Constitution and Declaration that all men would be granted the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as COVID continues to rage around us, we are reminded that part of that dream involves wealth and commerce, which we must find responsible ways to protect and sustain in times of crisis. But the dream of America, the dream of America was always a bigger dream. It's about people, the strongest or the most vulnerable, who we must see in all their humanity if we have any shot of moving this forward towards moving this country forward towards its greatest potential. As we grow older, our dreams evolve. Our country is an, evolution, is an example of such an evolution. But as we work to realize these dreams, we must also commit to what it all means and renew our sense of hope. In the renewal, we must often reimagine, given the cards we are dealt, what it all means, and how we must adjust. What I have learned is that during these many months, our brains have tried to adjust. 
I mean, the pandemic was foreign to all of us until it reached American soil, quickly becoming an unwelcome neighbor. This is a reality I experienced when I received the unexpected call from our very own Dr. Kapil Sharma, informing me that our brother, our beloved Rohit, was hospitalized in a critical condition with COVID-19. Within 30 minutes of hearing the news, Operation Rohit Strong was in full motion. Hundreds of photos, words of encouragement, funny jokes, and even videos of Rohit singing karaoke flooded the dedicated Rohit Slack channel the class created. A meal train for his wife Kanika and daughter Arohi was in motion so they didn't have to worry about his meals and could focus solely on Rohit's care. I spoke to Rohit shortly after he returned home from the hospital and I learned that he read every single comment, saw the photos and watched the videos as he slowly progressed towards less pain each day in the hospital. Rohit told me that the love and support and energy from this cohort literally saved his life. Let me repeat that. We saved our classmates life. At times like this, it's human nature to reflect on what you've been through, where you are today, and who you are becoming. I've done that myself. One evening, at the age of six years old, I waited, very impatiently, next to the, a telephone to find out that I had made the Travel All-Star soccer team. Impatient as all six-year-olds are, it was taking way too long. My grandpa, the relentless advocate we all need at one point or another, saw my distress and decided to call the phone company. He wanted to make sure that our phones weren't down as a result of the rain. See, that wasn't the problem. It was not the rain. That call that I so desperately waited for simply never came. At 29 years old, I was advised I may be too young to start the EMBA program. I should consider the full-time or evening and weekend programs because on paper, those students had a similar number of years of experience as I did. But I knew that I was already overseeing multi-million dollar projects and 300 people at my current job, and this cohort and this program was exactly where I belonged. So did these challenges define me? Kind of, in a way they did. They taught me how to build new dreams when the original ones never made it past my head. They also taught me that well-intentioned advice doesn't have to be the final word for me and doesn't have to be for you either. These and other disappointments didn't cause me to give up. Instead, they forced me to reconcile who I'd been, who I was in the moment, and who I wanted to become. If we're wise, if we are students of life, we are always reconciling these three people within ourselves. Who were you before a major life happening? Who were you during it? And who did you become because of it? How adaptable are you? How can you be the catalyst for change? Now, every class faces challenges, and every class is dealt some blows. I might argue ours were very swift and certainly quite plentiful. But herein lie the opportunity to become the leaders that business and our global society needs moving forward. When the university pivoted to Zoom, literally right before our last block of term three, most of us stuck with our classes, and innovated in our own ways to make online learning work. Was it perfect? Hell no. Did we adapt? You betcha. And might I add, we absolutely slayed the virtual background game. Winnie the Pooh, anyone? 
we came up with a way to recreate the in-person experience we so desperately longed for. Socially distanced hikes, small meetups in the North Bay, weekends in Santa Barbara, we were as connected as we safely could be. We even had Friendsgiving dinner together last November, despite being masked and outdoors. Virtual happy hours, pitch nights, shelter in place care packages of flowers, face masks, or baked goods. We adapted because that's what we do. We invited our kids and our pets into the Zoom classroom. And quite frankly, they often received more attention from our professors than we did. Can we just take a quick pause and give our support systems a huge round of applause? But while adaptation and resilience are notable qualities to hail, they do not come without the training grounds of pain, frustration, and the feeling of always being in limbo. I would be less than honest if I didn't address how the cumulative stress and trauma of these last 18 months didn't leave us with a profound sense of grief. But because this place is what it is, we had somewhere to go. Our faculty held safe spaces for us to debrief and grieve together. Thank you to Mora and Vaselina for unifying us in ways that go far beyond the classroom. Ina held virtual lectures about the economic impacts of COVID that the news didn't cover and how we can all be prepared in our own businesses about the stimulus package. She even cold called on us on the pre-assigned readings for these optional evening sessions. Laura Cray held discussions with the Wembas about gender discrimination in negotiations and how we should all support women at a time when the glass ceiling often feels indestructible. Professor Goodson held water cooler chats and one-on-one -on -one office hours to coach us and mentor us. And most recently, Mora invited us to her wonderful Seattle home, shared her love of cooking, sourcing the most fine local ingredients, and preparing us and our families a special meal. At the start of my MBA journey, when I imagined graduation day, I didn't think about it being against the backdrop of civil unrest, raging fires, and a pandemic. This is not how our EMBA experience is supposed to go. However, what we think should be and what really is are often not the same thing. Option A doesn't always work out. What this cohort has proven is that when option A suddenly becomes unavailable, we just kick the shit out of option B. And let me tell you, our collective option B is something to celebrate. We have welcomed, or in the process of welcoming, 14 new EMBA babies during the program. to bring our total count to 87 kiddos. In addition to that, we've seen the births of startups, search funds, weddings, promotions, new jobs, new homes, and new friendships. We were blindsided by challenges we hadn't even dreamed of, and we beat them. If any generation doesn't trust us or underestimates us, well, they just simply have not been paying attention to who we are. Each generation has had a definitive challenge, something that's marked its time on this earth and proven yet again the fortitude of the human spirit. Our time in human history, well, it'll likely mark a pivot of almost everything that came before us. There was something about this place, 
not Hertz Hall, but this place. It wasn't Haas who changed who we were, no. It was Haas that reminded us of who we can be and that we don't always have to conform to the status quo. It was here where someone asked when gender equality was ever the exception and not the rule. And it was here where our Wembas, the women, raised their voices to say, right now. Here, here we learn the true meaning of leaning in and pushing through. Here, we became Rohit Strong. Here, we have become the leaders that business needs and the world craves. My hope is that as we go our own ways and blaze our own trails, we are always reflecting and reconciling the three people within ourselves. Who we were before, who we are in the moment, and who we are becoming. The world that existed before we started business school is just simply not the world we're in today. We'll be able to say that we went to school at a time where the meaning of Zoom went from to go fast or a Lionel Richie song our parents listened to, to business at the top, bedtime at the bottom style of hosting board meetings. The era of change was already upon us before 2020. The pandemic just put that into overdrive. We have learned to go for what we want and to place our mental health at the forefront while doing it. We have learned to lean in with the fortitude of those who have come before us and to pay closer attention to our inner selves like those coming behind us. We're forging a society we haven't seen before. And in my own opinion, we're doing a pretty good job. And while business is changing, thanks to this university, this program, these instructors, and these challenges, we're uniquely equipped to be the catalysts of that change. Now is our opportunity to capitalize on this grand shift and create a society we all know is possible, and in many ways, much more beneficial than the ones we grew up in. My dearest friends, my Amba family, we can collectively say, curtain down. We are at the end. We've made it through this journey. And while it did not look like we thought it would, because life rarely does, it was marvelous anyway. If you don't remember anything I say today, please remember this. It always works out in the end. And if it's not working out, then it's not the end. Thank you for the pleasure of spending these last two and a half years with you all and for the honor of addressing you all today. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was an incredible speech. Thank you. So each year, we have called upon an alum of uncommon distinction to address the Executive MBA graduating class as the commencement speaker. We seek a person who embodies a commitment to excellence and possesses a distinguished record of achievement as well as someone who works to make the world a better place to live. This year, we are delighted that your commencement speaker is such a leader and one of our own. Dr. Wolfgang Stare, EMBA 2016. 
Dr. Stair is a pediatric surgeon and the medical director of surgery at Presbyterian Healthcare Services. Prior to joining Presbyterian, he worked at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, serving as the hospital's division chief of pediatric surgery. He performed about 20 pediatric surgeries per week, ranging from one pound premature babies to teenage gunshot victims. Not only did Dr. Stair save lives, but he put all four defining leadership principles into action to transform the hospital's culture, improve communications among doctors and nurses, and create a better experience for staff and patients. He did all of this by tapping lessons gleaned from his leadership communications course taught by Haas lecturer Mark Rittenberg. Dr. Stair also served as a Berkeley Haas lecturer for two years and taught leadership communications for students interested in healthcare and business. Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Wolfgang Stair. Thank you, Dean Harrison, distinguished faculty, guests, friends and family of the graduates, graduates. January 20th, 2017, I sat in those seats and it was the proudest day of my life until today, because today I get to celebrate with you. I get to celebrate your graduation. I get to celebrate the graduation of the Berkeley Haas Executive MBA Class of 2020. Go Bears! <laughs> and look who has shown up. I invite you all to stand up and look around the room and look at all the people who came today to celebrate you, who celebrated your accomplishment. Get up, take a look, look at them. Maybe you can wave at them. Maybe you can point your finger at them. And maybe you can blow them a kiss. They're all here for you. And after I was done with my MBA, I was ready to change the world. I was ready to get a promotion. I was ready to recover some of the investment I had made over those two years. But everything came different. A month after graduation, I herniated a disc in my back and I couldn't walk. I had to have surgery. A few months later, I got a new contract offer from my employer with a 50% pay cut and a 50% cut in vacation, and I had just gotten this MBA, and it didn't really take an MBA to realize that this wasn't a good offer. <laughs> but here's what the MBA did for me. The MBA gave me the confidence, with some attitude, to say no to such a bad offer, because I knew I was going to be okay, and I knew what I was worth. So I left the Bay Area, I took a part-time job in Albuquerque, New Mexico. In the meantime, I learned how to walk again, I took care of myself, burnout went way out the window, wellness, I ate better, I traveled, I made music, life was great. But then these little voices came, it's like, you're a loser, you're a failure, you're really not using your MBA, you're not going, doing everything that you can do. But at the same time, I was having a wonderful time. And I was great, and it was like I was traveling, and I was here I was, and I fell in love again with surgery, and I fell in love with my life, and I fell in love with my wife. And then COVID came. You all know it. But in the hospital, patients show up, and we had nothing to offer to them. We didn't have a cure, we didn't have a treatment, we didn't have a vaccine yet, and all we could offer them was empathy, holding hands, and compassion. And then, less than a year later, through a worldwide collaboration of scientists, 
we now have a vaccine. And guess what happens in the hospital? We still have people coming to the emergency room every day because they didn't get the vaccine. They didn't want it. Maybe they were scared, maybe they were misinformed, but here they are still dying from COVID and we still don't have a cure, we still don't have a treatment. Sometimes we still don't have ventilators and all we could offer, and now it's gotten a lot harder, was empathy and compassion and love. But they could have been saved. They didn't have to get that sick. They could have gotten this free vaccine. In a state like New Mexico, you got $100 if you took the vaccine, right? They gave you a lottery ticket for a $5 million lottery if you got the vaccine. And so I had to go kind of in a deeper place in my heart and dig deeper so I could still offer them empathy and compassion. Even though they had made a decision that I didn't agree with. But what about my career, right? Here I am offering compassion and love and empathy, but I wanted to run the hospital. I wanted to have a career. I wanted to really put my MBA to work. And that's when I took my MBA diploma and I waved it at people. I said, hey, I got this MBA, I got this MBA, I got this MBA, I got this MBA from Berkeley, here I am, right? But guess what? Nobody cared. <laughs> and that's when I remember this quote from Maya Angelou, the late Maya Angelou, and I paraphrased on purpose. She said, nobody cares what you say, but people will care how you make them feel. So I started to show up differently. I started to make the people around me feel safe, feel heard, feel included. I inoculated the environment around me with my self, with my leadership. Heck, I became the vaccine for my environment. And all of a sudden, March, this year, I was offered this huge promotion, like three rungs up on this ladder, and I'm now the medical director of surgery of this organization that has 10 hospitals and covers the entire state. And my first thought was, oh, snap. Am I ready for this? And I tell you, I was ready, because this prepared me for it. And I'm learning new things every day. I'm feeling, again, like a student, always, and I'm telling you the story for two reasons. I wanna give you two 100% certain guarantees. The value of this MBA does not diminish over time after graduation. Quite the opposite. The value goes up because of you. You now have this knowledge, you have the skills, you have the emotional intelligence to choose and decide how you want to bring your leadership to the world around you, how you want to inoculate the world around you. And two, the value of your MBA is in no shape or form diminished because you got it during a worldwide pandemic. Quite the opposite. You heard the dean. Today more than ever, the world needs you as leaders. The world needs Berkeley leaders who can inoculate the world around them with love and empathy and compassion. Because people will not remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wolfgang, about telling us your amazing journey in leadership, vaccines, and love. That was incredibly inspirational. We've really appreciated the time you've taken also to inspire the class with your words. So it's now my pleasure 
to introduce my Berkeley Haas colleague, Emma Hayes Daftery, the Executive Director of the Berkeley MBA for Executives program, who will present our Earl F. Chait Award for Excellence in Teaching. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to present on your behalf the Chite Award for Excellence in Teaching. The Chite Award is named after our late Dean Emeritus, Earl Chite, who greatly valued effective teaching here at Haas. The awards are not a popularity contest. They are judged by student committees on the basis of the following criteria. Excellence in teaching, genuine interest in students, and sincere concern for individual development of students. There were many incredibly worthy nominees for the Chite Award this year. I'm constantly blown away by the quality and commitment of the world-class faculty who teach in our program and here at Haas. To win the Chite Award is to be acknowledged as a standout among standouts. This year's winner is Professor Ina Simonowska. You tell us that Ina is not only an excellent instructor, but that she exemplifies the school's defining leadership principles. She listened to feedback from the class, adjusted based on the, excuse me, adjusted based on the success or challenges in prior classes, and truly exhibited what it means to go beyond herself and to be a student always. Ina always brought real-world aspects to the classroom and was readily available to everyone for discussion and questions. She made the content as timely and relevant as possible. You all see some old cases, but Ina's were up to the minute. Her passion is unparalleled. Ina adapted easily to remote learning during COVID and she did so in 48 hours. She even joined in on some post-term Zoom meetings to chat about the world economy during a global pandemic. She made sure you all understood real-time events impacting the world economy. The care, attention, and dedication to the course and the cohort make her the best candidate for receiving this honor. Congratulations again, Ina. You may now use the honorary title of Distinguished Teaching Fellow at the Haas School of Business. Ina, I invite you to the podium. Well, well, thank you. It is such an honor to be given an award by people who I respect and I admire deeply. To be honest though, the most rewarding part for me was just being able to teach you, to learn from you, and just to get to know all of you. This is just bonus. It's a beautiful bonus but it's just bonus, okay? Now, let's be honest. We know why I got this award. It's because I modified my slides on the yield curve at one o'clock in the morning, the night before our 9 a.m. lecture, when of course I was supposed to teach you that the yield curve is upward sloping 
and it decided to invert on us the previous day. That's what we do in this class, right? As real time as it gets. Now, our time was short, to be honest, a little too short for my taste, but we had way too many memories. And of course, I could spend all day talking about them, but I'll only emphasize a few here. So starting off with Nargis and Andrew, who greeted me so nicely during <laughs> my visit to Shahar's class, asking me if I was one of the prospective students. <laughs> I was like, yay. <laughs> then, of course, how could I forget during every single break in the ladies' room, Sylvia would ask me questions about the Federal Reserve Bank <laughs> during my 10-minute break. <laughs> or is it maybe Vince's three-page essays in the middle of the night, ranting about economics, finance, fintech, and everything under the sun, and expecting a reply? <laughs> And then, of course, there's Stephanus and Angus, who every time I would utter a word about policy would stop me and would make sure that I explained myself. They always wanted to know more. And then, finally, of course, the Indian Parliament fiasco. <laughs> who could forget that moment? Boy, why didn't I not bring a whistle to class that day? Truly memorable. Now, from day one, it was so obvious to me that you were all there to learn, to question everything. And to be honest, that is the best part about being a professor, is to see that among the students. That's what makes the class. You guys made the class, not me. I was just a referee most of the time, right? Now, I'm so proud of all of you. It's, as Dean Harrison said, it is very challenging and very difficult to study full time while having your own career, while balancing family, while balancing your own life. But you know what? We're all in the same boat, and that's why we connected so much, because we were all on that same level. But what makes your class special is, of course, the perseverance the dedication, and the commitment to maintaining a group no matter what. Yeah, it sucked that we were interrupted by COVID, and I was not excited to be given a 46-hour notice, in fact, <laughs> to prepare and to pivot to Zoom. But you know what? We made it happen. And that class, that Zoom class that we had, was actually one of my best memories because we spent time talking about the macro implications of the pandemic, and it was at that moment that I understood that I had finally achieved my goal, which was to make a casual economist out of you. Why is that? Because you were able to talk through things through the lens of the macro models that we learned in class. And at that point, I was done. I felt that my job was done. But no, Alex didn't feel that my job was done, and neither did Nargis, which is why we had all the virtual meetings afterwards, which actually turned out to be great, right? And we got to talk about lots of economics, and I'm sure we will do more after, after um, the ceremony ends today. But what I thought would be best was rather than me talking is to really give everybody an idea of why this class was the best class that we took, right? So, who read the articles I sent you last night? <laughs> okay, uh, Joe, I know you like to get your participation points, <laughs> right? Um, the other Joe, I don't see unicorns on me here, so nothing to distract you. Where's Marissa? Marissa, you're always overprepared. Come on, come on, give me something. I know, where's Kapil? I don't see Kapil. Well, he knows the answer, for sure. What's the, what is the word that's on everyone's mind right now, Kapil? Thank you, Kapil. Participation credit earned. That's exactly right, inflation. So, let's talk about it over drinks later, which is what casual economists do, all right? I expect a lot of entertainment from you. Isaiah, and from Alex with some Latin vibes. I will see you guys.
after this commencement's over. Congratulations. It's been great getting to know all of you. Thank you again. Ina, thank you. 46 hours, I will make note. <laughs> um, it gives me great pleasure to also announce the winner of the Haas Outstanding Graduate Student Instructor Award for the EMBA program. A graduate student instructor, or GSI, serves as an apprentice under the active supervision of the faculty member who's the instructor of record for the course. This year's Outstanding Graduate Student Instructor Award goes to Sarah Neff. You tell us that Sarah's GSI instruction sessions became a lifeline for the cohort. Not only was she able to effectively answer complex questions, she is also able to explain the course concepts in a way that is understandable to folks who are completely unfamiliar with economics. Her thoughtful ability to handle both ends of the spectrum within the audience while enhancing the collective learning was absolutely outstanding. Please join me in congratulating Sarah as the outstanding GSI for the Berkeley MBA for Executives Class of 2020. Congratulations, Sarah. Sarah just informed me that she's come home to Berkeley to continue on with her PhD in economics here at Cal. So we're so delighted she's gonna be a triple bear. We're now going to turn to our Class of 2020 Academic Achievement Award. To be the valedictorian amongst a selective group of the best and brightest MBA students is quite an accomplishment. And this year, because you are the extraordinary, intrepid class of 2020, there are two valedictorians. This year's valedictorians for the EMBA program are Rossi Arnudova and Angus Coyle. In order to do well as a student in EMBA, one needs the foundations of intelligence and the ability to compartmentalize. Work, family, friends, life, classmates, faculty, all while taking full advantage of everything that Haas and Cal have to offer. Indeed, our valedictorian award goes beyond celebrating the student with the highest GPA. It also celebrates the student, or in this case, two students, who excel in an intense and accelerated environment. I'd like to read a few quotes from your cohort about both Rossi and Angus. Rossi has been the VP of academics, but has worked so hard for the cohort on all fronts. She takes her role seriously and is constantly trying to engage our class on the topics of academics. She's been a perfect and tireless intermediary with our professors. I really do not know how she has the time 
to do any of the extra school activities and still be such an ace student. And about Angus. Angus is easily one of the hardest working, intelligent, yet quietly confident members of our cohort. When Angus shares his experiences and perspectives, everyone in the cohort listens and his takes are extremely balanced and wise. He is so thoughtful, curious, and prepared. It is my great pleasure to introduce Rossi and Angus as your valedictorians. Thank you for a very generous introduction, Emma. Well, before we begin, Nargis, one last time, would you be our scribe, please? <laughs> True to the Haas leadership principles, we decided to question the status quo of valedictory, and this is why you see both of us standing here right in front of you and addressing you at the same time. Um, we want to have a conversation. We wanted to do something different, and we want to reflect on our journey to this day and also on the road moving forward. And yes, you all will have to turn in your reflection papers after the ceremony is over. Thank you very much. Now, first things first. Uh, back in Chaminade over two years ago now, we all learned the importance of a good story when addressing your audience. And thanks to Joe O'Brien's memorable demonstration, we all know exactly what a vertical takeoff looks like. But the story I want to hear today is this. Angus, how did you make the choice of joining Haas? Well, Rossi, the funny thing is that the choice was not the hard part. I mean, who wouldn't want to look like this on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon? Right? The hard part was on April 29th, 2015. I was working late in San Francisco, seventh floor, Downtown, Cube Farm, you can imagine it. 80s corporate drab gray furniture, 80s drab gray walls. I was the only one there, and I was two weeks away from starting this program. And I got a call, and the call told me that I had failed. That call was with respect to a scholarship that I was trying to get and that I needed in order to get into this program and make it work. And as I was standing there looking out at the skyline and just thinking about this call, I thought this cannot be happening. I don't fail at this stuff. And then gradually I started to realize this is happening. I had just gone through months of corporate hunger games, going from 100 applicants down to 10 then down to two, and I had failed. And so I had to call and pull out of the program before I ever started. That failure ultimately led to me losing career direction. I tried two years later to get into the program and make it work, and it didn't. And it sent me off on a journey that only four years later would actually bring me to this wonderful cohort that I've been so happy to be with. So that's my story, Rossi. But I'm guessing, knowing you like I do, that you had a plan and then you executed it with 100% efficiency. <laughs> um, actually, I did not. It was quite a journey. And that journey started about 25 plus years ago now, when my mom would wake up every Sunday at 3 a.m. to get to her weekend job so that she could get extra cash and pay the young and talented language arts professor for my English classes and I will be translating this uh, speech for my mom later. Um, I won't overwhelm you with details. Uh, let's just say I got extremely lucky to be around wicked smart, ambitious, extremely supportive people that became my role models and that kept pushing me and keep pushing me every single day. And what matters is that through a lot of hard work, some lucky coincidences, a few leaps of faith and, uh, you know, a few 
less than obvious or easy choices, all of us, myself included, ended up here at Haas. Yeah, it's important for us not to forget the challenges and the journey that led us to this point. And to honor those challenges and that journey by making sure that this experience and that Berkeley never becomes just a check the box exercise. And when I think about how we can honor that journey and those experiences, it occurs to me that it's about the mindset we carry, the perspective that separates this program from just about any other. For instance, our school was interrupted, but we are still graduating from one of the finest institutes of higher learning in the world. Some 200,000 students get their MBA every year. There's less than 100 of us. And consider last night. We were faced with the terrible choice between lamb, chicken, or vegetarian entrees at the dinner in our honor. It's easy to forget that 40 million Americans live below the poverty line, and one third of those households are classified as, classified as food insecure. And we can honor this program of what we've gone through by remembering each time we complain about online schooling or working from home, that for those of us lucky enough to still have jobs, two thirds of those people do not have any choice but to show up on a daily basis risking COVID. And I'm talking here about the nurses who save our lives. I'm talking about the agricultural workers who put food on our plates. I'm talking about the factory workers who build the stuff that we buy. And yes, I'm talking about the construction laborers who I work with every day. And we honored this journey by asking the tough questions that other people maybe don't. For instance, why do we have so many unions in this country? I'll tell you why we have so many unions. It's because of a legacy of 200 years of horrible management. Narrow-minded, short-sighted corporate leadership that has lost all sight of humanity. And I'm looking at you, tech giants. And so, Rossi, we honor this journey by maintaining this perspective. As we, the EMBA class of 2020, stand at this threshold, the pivot points for us personally, for our jobs, for the country, and yes, for the globe. But now that I've brought down the mood in the room, <laughs> I'd like to know what you think. Well, I will tell you a secret. My greatest fear, and also the driving force in life, is the fear of regrets. Waking up one day, looking back, and realizing that I could have and should have done more, been more, said more, helped more, tried more, took more risks, and left a more lasting impact. The nerd on me, and obviously that's one of the reasons I'm standing here, uh, thinks of life as a massive decision tree, where we, the choices we make today impact not only our individual futures, but also the futures and the lives of people in our families, at our teams at work, and also in our community. As Angus said, there is no shortage of societal and business problems waiting out there, and you know, they're ready for us, and they are waiting to be addressed. And as now we wrap up this chapter of the Amber journey, I invite you all to go out there and make the daring choices, risk, and set audacious goals with the same level of commitment, determination, and intentionality that brought you here. And know that you now not only have all the tools that you learned in the program, which was one of the goals of getting here, but you also have the extended AMBA family that will support you every step of the way, will cheer you, and will catch you if you start falling, and Last but not least, we'll celebrate with you. Much love, Embas. That's yours. That was crazy. I can take you. Yeah, that's it. Each EMBA cohort nominates fellow students for Defining Leadership Principles Awards. 
question the status quo, confidence without attitude, students always, beyond yourself, and the Berkeley Leader Award. We celebrated and announced this year's recipients at a farewell dinner last night. We also want to honor them now and ask that they please stand as I call their name. The awardees for Question the Status Quo, Sarah Morrill, Paris Latham, and Amber Jones. The awardees for Confidence Without Attitude, Benindu Isaiah Samuel, and Marisa Hewitt. The awardees for Students Always, Michael Kim, Stephanos Macris, and Nargis Ataran. The awardee for Beyond Yourself, Hannah Greenberg. And the awardees for the Berkeley Leader Awards, Hannah Greenberg, Nargis Ataran, and Rossi Arnudova. And now, will the degree candidates please rise? Latham. Sanej Bangar.
Cheng Kuang Zeng. Nicholas Graupi. Ryan Richards. Sumit Pantakar. Graduating with honors, Marisa Hewitt. Hansen. Graduating with honors, Sarah Morrow. Tiasha Ren Ganathan. Graduating with honors, Charles Shimooka. Jin. 
Srinivasan Mohan. Gabrielle Lewis. Graduating with honors, Kapil Sharma. <laughs> Kurt Peters. Jessica Patterson. Rohit Agarwala. Alexander Web Weber Shapiro. <laughs> Diane Galindo. Parala. Nargis Ataran.
Jo o Déu. Young Yu Kim. Vivaka Kasibotla. Krishna Kolada. Manoj Patel. Graduating with honors, Matthew Zirha. Ambrish Tripathi. Ben Nagar. Deepak Shirimala. Sylvia Patricia Ochoa. Dennis Dancer. Kishore Koriko. <laughs> Shahed Bekhtar. Tao Young Amber Jones. Pinindo Isaiah Samuel.
Stephanos Macris. Lavinia Herbey. Viendo Roy. Nicholas Andrews. Satomi Rush Ziegler. <laughs> Graduating with honors, Angus Coyle. Graduating with honors, Rossi Arnadova. <laughs> Hannah Greenberg. Who are not here today with us? Uh, Martin Ankawi Jaya. Rachel Kuninen. John Malcolm. AJ Roberts. and Nihar Bora. Will all the candidates for the degree Master of Business Administration please rise. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the President of the University of California and the Chancellor of UC Berkeley, I grant you the degree Master of Business Administration. may now be seated. It is now official. All of the graduates here have commenced a new lifelong relationship as alumni with Berkeley Haas. We welcome you to this new distinction. As I bring this ceremony to a close, please remain seated as the faculty and the new graduates process out of the hall. We invite you to enjoy the beautiful Hertz Hall venue for photo opportunities with your new graduates before you proceed to the Haas School, 
The reception will begin at 5 p.m. in the O'Donnell Courtyard. We are full of pride at your achievement today, and we eagerly anticipate your great accomplishments in the future. You have my best wishes for your success. Congratulations, and thank you all for being here today. This commencement ceremony is concluded. Yeah.